Matthew 20, beginning at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. To those men, he said, you also go to my vineyard and I'll give you whatever is right. So off they went. About noon and at three, he went out again and did the same thing. Then about five, he went out and found others standing around and said to them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they said to him. You also go to my vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who have hired about five came, they each received one denarius. So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more, but they also received a denarius each. When they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These last men put in one hour, and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day and the burning heat. He replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my business? Are you jealous because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first last. While going up to Jerusalem, Jesus took the 12 disciples aside privately and said to them on the way, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes and they'll condemn him to death. Then they'll hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged and crucified. And he'll be resurrected on the third day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, On its website, the Department of Home Affairs has a document. Uh, The Department of Home Affairs has been in the media a fair bit lately, hasn't it? Uh, It has a document titled Australian Values Statement. Uh, It outlines the values that define what it means to be Australian, our culture in our land. Uh, One of the values that are listed is we are a fair go culture. I, I don't think anyone in this room would disagree with that. As part of our everyday vocab, part of our collective memory, the way we do things around here. In fact, I think if you boil it down, and we often do, most of us would summarise a fair go culture as you get what you deserve. You get what you deserve. Uh, That's become ingrained in our relationships. It's the way we assess each other and events, even in the way we judge a person's character and worth. If you actually go back in history to 1907, it was the foundation of the harvester judgment. We all know what that is, don't we? Well, that's the judgment that laid the basis for the minimum wage in Australia. And in the judge's finding, pay had to be a fair go to establish a minimum wage. In fact, in many of our communities and relationships and groups, it's actually become the gate by which we let people in or we don't, isn't it? Who gets into our community? Well, not the bludgers and those who waste what they've been given. Those who work, those who get what they deserve, they're welcome. I actually don't think it would be too much of a stretch to say that a fair go is the hallmark of what it means to be Australian, the defining feature of our culture. What's the hallmark of the kingdom of heaven? What defines its culture? We're going to look at that today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for its goodness. Thank you that we can actually sit here and read it in such comfort. Uh, Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he taught so clearly using images that were really quite discerning and differentiating, confronting, easy to understand. Father, thanks for grace, for receiving what we do not deserve when we deserve your judgment. Please grab us by your grace today. In Jesus' name, amen. While Matthew's writing a good news biography of Jesus, he's experienced the goodness of Jesus. Matthew chapter 9, a tax collector, an outsider brought in. That's the message of the whole biography of Jesus. Jesus brings the outsider inside. The outsider is the sinner, the person who said, actually, I can do a better job than God. And so they are outside God's rule. 
and God is committed to bringing them in, isn't he? And he sends Jesus to do that. Outsiders are brought in by being connected to Jesus, by depending upon him and everything he is. Last week we saw that those who belong in the kingdom of God are those who are the dependent, dependent on Jesus alone. Those who insist on being independent, I'll do it my own way, they're actually not in the kingdom of God. And last week we were reminded that Jesus reassured his disciples that God would make this possible and he is abundant in his goodness. Well, bouncing off that statement in verse 30 at the end of chapter 19, Jesus continues to describe, I'm at point two on the outline, what the kingdom of heaven is like. Look there at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. Now, before we go any further and unpack this, worth remembering two parts of this narrative. Who's Jesus talking to? He's just talking to the 12. This is not a statement about the wider culture out there. He's not proclaiming judgment or grace on the wider world. He's, it's a teaching moment with the 12, with the mob, a, a parable that's quite discerning. It's a parable that's quite confronting, but Jesus is very clearly speaking it to the 12. Secondly, remember that Jesus has just reassured them. That's what we looked at last week, wasn't it? Uh, Jesus has just reassured them. Remember that shiny young man? who turned up and said, what what do I need to do? What good must I do to inherit eternal life? And that man who was independent, who when he was faced by the prospect of dependency, faced by being stripped back by God, was grieved. And Jesus reassured his disciples of the goodness of dependency. The first will be last. The independent will be reduced and the last will be first. The dependent will be lifted up. That was verse 30. The dependent will be on the right side of history. They'll be brought in by Jesus. That is such an encouraging reassurance. And so he keeps talking with the 12 and keeps talking about this kingdom and what it's like with a parable which is actually quite sharp. We've just heard it read. Let me just run through it very quickly. A vineyard owner needs workers. He goes out in the early morning and he hires some. Uh, They have their workplace negotiation and they come up with a bargaining agreement, one denarius for the day. Uh, That's at the upper end of what is very generous. The upper end of what is very generous, sufficient for a worker to support their family. Uh, At nine in the morning, he goes out to get more workers. The assumption is that the wage is the same. And notice there in verse four, the owner says, I'll give you whatever is right. Literally, I'm righteous. I'm righteous in what I pay. Twice more he heads out and finds out more workers. At the end of the day, let's say about an hour before knockoff, he goes out and he finds one more group of workers. He's been a busy owner, hasn't he, going out to find workers? Knockoff comes, the foreman's called in, sent out to pay the workers, start with the last. And what do they receive? They get a denarius. They get the generous wage. By the time the foreman gets to those employed first, they've come to an assumption, haven't they? Did you notice that there in verse 10? They assumed that their pay would be more, but they also received a denarius. That's not fair. Hang on. (laughs) Where's the fair game culture here? What do we deserve? We've borne the brunt, we've been in the sun the longest, we've worked the hardest. And they start complaining. The owner responds. Legally, he's done the right thing. That was the agreement, wasn't it? They agreed to a denarius and he's paid them generously. Relationally, he's done the right thing. In terms of his authority and his character, remember, he pays what's right. He has every right to conduct this as he has done. Literally in verse 15, he confronts them. You've suddenly become evil in your eyes when you've seen how generous I am. Why is that? And then he summarizes it in verse 16. Look at it there. So the last will be first and the first last. Now before I draw out some observations from this parable, let let me just point out two aspects of it. The nature of the owner is made very clear, isn't it? 
Uh, did you see that there? He owns his vineyard and so he has, like we would expect, complete authority in his vineyard. He's a generous and a righteous man. And notice that the workers don't come to him. He goes to find the workers. He's generous to the point that he actually goes and finds people who need a job. And then he treats them generously. And the second aspect to notice is the language of Matthew. And the way in which Matthew is written applies this language every time someone reads it, even from the first century. And there in verses 6 and 7, you've got three verbs, said, said, and told. Unlike every other verb in the parable, they suddenly become the present tense. Every other verb's in the past, but suddenly you have these things happening in the present. It's kind of like Matthew saying as a reader, come in and stand with these workers. Which workers are they? Well, they're the ones who were employed last. So every reader of Matthew is invited to stand with those employed last and to think about what they're receiving and what's taking place. Now, with that in mind, point three on the outline, let me, let me make some observations. Uh, the characters are very clear. That's the first observation. Uh, the owner of the vineyard, who do you think that might be? Uh, it's probably God or at least Jesus. Uh, the owner has all authority. The owner always does what is right. The owner is generous. The workers don't come to the owner. The owner goes to find the workers. And he pays them abundantly. The workers in the vineyard, they're all those connected to the owner who've been found by him. Put it simply, it's the disciples. Anyone who is in the kingdom because they depend upon Jesus. Uh, observation two, uh, if you had to describe the motto or the coat of arms of this vineyard and the work, the owner, uh, what would you put on it? What word? Uh, I think the hallmark is grace. The hallmark of the owner and the hallmark of the workplace environment is grace. Giving what is not deserved to those who deserve something else. Giving what is not deserved to those who deserve something else. It's the distinguishing feature of the owner. He goes to find the workers, he gives them a generous wage, and he provides them what none of them have deserved, even those first workers. <laughs> no, they weren't going to find a job, were they? He went and found them and gave them a job. And it's the defining feature of the economy of the vineyard. Everyone gets what they don't deserve. A generous wage they didn't really work for. Third observation. Matthew writes in such a way that the reader is meant to identify with that last group employed. Today that's us, isn't it? And in such a way, it brings us face to face with grace. It explodes every expectation and reasonable assumption about what we think is fair and reasonable. In fact, such a realisation forces us to consider, what, what do I really deserve from God as an outsider? As someone who has said, I can do a better job of God than God. What do I deserve? Fourth observation. Matthew writes in such a way that the complaint of the first group of workers, their natural assumption, well, if they get that, oh, surely I'll get more. Matthew writes in such a way that that understanding of grace is often abused, misused, over-familiarised, as soon as an entitlement, and Matthew exposes that. The present tense confronts us as readers as we consider grace and the complaint of the first workers confronts us as people who've received grace. Would we ever make such an assumption once we're in? Would we ever feel so entitled to grace once we're dependent on Jesus? Would we limit who deserves grace once we've received it? once we're dependent on Jesus. In fact, this is a fifth observation, the summary of Jesus in verse 16 confronts us with what he's aiming at here. This is not a reassurance, this is a warning. Jesus doesn't repeat chapter 19 verse 30. 
Did you notice that? He actually changes it slightly, but importantly. If you've got your Bibles there, look at chapter 19, verse 30. He was reassuring the disciples, many who are first will be last and the last first. The independent ones will be brought down, the first will be made last, and the dependent ones, you'll be on the right side of history, the last will be made first. But did you notice the change in verse 16? So the last will be first and the first last. He slightly changed the words, hasn't he? And this time he's warning the disciples who are listening, don't be cocky in your grace. Don't become self-centered or self-righteous in the grace. Don't become possessive or entitled about the grace you've been given. Perhaps they'd misunderstood that assurance of 12 thrones. Perhaps they'd done a bit of a fist pump when they realized they're on the right side of history. And Jesus has targeted their hearts and behavior here. And as he summarizes it in verse 16, the issue here is not whether the dependent need reassuring. The issue here is that the dependent need warning. Grace applies to everyone. So do you notice the change in verse 16? The last will be first. Everyone who works in the vineyard gets the same pay. Even those who've been in the kingdom from the beginning, the first shall be last. If Australia is proud about being a fair go culture, Jesus has just clearly proclaimed that he runs a grace economy. Jesus has just clearly proclaimed that he runs a grace economy, giving what is not deserved to those who are outsiders. And in case we miss it, we then get a worked example in verses 17 to 19, don't we? I'm at point four on the outline, while going up to Jerusalem, Jesus took the 12 disciples aside again, those 12, and privately said to them on the way, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes. They'll condemn him to death. Then they'll hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. He'll be resurrected on the third day. He's been taking a number of weeks to get to Jerusalem. As he walks there, he takes the 12 aside privately, just like he did in verses 1 to 16, and he talks to them. Why are we heading to Jerusalem? We're heading there so that the Son of Man, Jesus' term for himself, a term they know. Where does the word phrase Son of Man come from? It comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, where the Son of Man is given all authority in heaven and on earth. And Jesus says, that son of man, the bloke walking with you, he's walking to Jerusalem so that he will be handed over, condemned, mocked, flogged, crucified, and then resurrected. This is a man described as the son of God, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. This is the man who fulfills the whole of God's law perfectly. This is the one recognized by foreigners as the king of the Jews. This is the one who looks the devil in the eye and tells him to rack off. This is the man revealed in all glory on a mountain peak. This is the man who feeds thousands with abundance, who walks on water, who rebukes creation, who's recognized by demons who flee from him. This man will be rejected, humiliated, crucified. The first shall be last. The Son of God will be reduced to death as a human, and then he'll be raised. The last will be first. It's a worked example, isn't it, of what grace is. In case we missed it, Jesus makes sure the twelve hear it, and Matthew makes sure that we read it. Be assured, if you're dependent on him, But don't be entitled in that grace because grace means this. If Australia's a fair go culture, I'm at point five, then the kingdom of heaven is a grace economy, isn't it? If Australia is a fair go culture, then the kingdom of heaven is a grace economy. We don't receive what we deserve, do we? Imagine if we did. We receive what we don't deserve. We receive the life, death, and resurrection of the Son of Man. We receive 
the first becoming last so that the last might become first. And that's grace, isn't it? So what do we do with it? Which seems like a strange question when you ask about grace, doing stuff. Uh, Let me tell you how we can't apply this, okay? This is not a parable about what you pay your workers. This is not a parable about what you pay your workers, although as a Christian employer reading this parable, you might actually be pushed to generosity. But it's not about that. This is not about the nation of Israel versus the disciples. Other parts of the Bible deal with that. That's why we're getting Philip Kerner. Notice Jesus just talks to the 12 about being in the kingdom. He's reassuring them and then he's warning them who were the first employed in the vineyard. So now we've worked out how not to apply it. How, how would we apply it? Well, you've got some suggestions there on your outline. Four quick suggestions. First, I think we've got to rejoice, don't we? <laughs> we've just come face to face with grace. God's kingdom doesn't work on a fair go. God's kingdom works on grace. We receive what we do not deserve. We receive the Son of Man crucified for us. We receive all of his perfection when we trust in him. We receive the room he gets ready in heaven for us. That's grace. We now live in a kingdom not of a fair go, not vindictive, not cancellation, and not of reminding people of their eternal errors unceasingly. We live in a kingdom that runs on kindness, generosity, abundant grace from the top down. And we know that because Jesus the king lived grace for us, didn't he? We just saw the worked example. And he sets the tone of the kingdom. So so what's our first response? Please rejoice. We've received what we don't deserve. And that rejoicing becomes heightened when we realise what we should have received from God. Second, recognise. Please recognise the nature of grace and the nature of our king. Who's, Who's our king, Jesus? Well, if he's the owner of the vineyard, he has all authority. And in that authority, he is abundantly generous and always right. Jesus will never commit evil. Jesus will never command us something that is less than good and righteous. Jesus is always full of grace. And so there's our way of understanding him and following him and serving him and considering him and appreciating him and obeying him. The hallmark of his rule is grace. We're given all of his perfection because of his death. There's no limit to this grace except whether you receive it or not. (laughs) There's no boundary to this grace except whether you refuse it or not. Jesus embodies this grace in the way he lived, died, and rose. That's the flavour of the kingdom. Is that how we understand grace? Thirdly, repent. There is a warning, uh, and it's meant to be there. It's a parable that warns. Once we've come into the kingdom by grace, please hear the warning about entitlement. Please hear the warning about self-righteousness and being possessive about this grace. We must repent, turn away from the view of grace that says, I deserved it. (laughs) Look how shiny I am. That views grace as receiving more than what God has given us. That sees grace as something I've earned or worked for, that sees grace as something kept by how I deserve it, that sees grace as a relative gift. I'm going to get more than you. That begrudges grace to others. That complains that grace is extended to, really, that person? Would we ever treat grace that way? Would we ever mutate grace into a fair go culture? You're going to get what you deserve. Would we ever hide a secret works mentality? behind the songs we sing, 
and the things we say at church or in Bible study. Would we ever hold grace in such a way that it's inaccessible to others because maybe they don't deserve it? If we do, we must repent. Finally, let's respond. Let's respond. That's why that Titus 3 reading was so good. You were once like this, but now you've received this. Let's be people who are so dependent on Jesus and all that he's done that we don't just proclaim grace, we practice it. We practice grace without the limits of skin colour, of right, of family heritage or criminal record, of where you live in town or where you grew up. We actually extend grace the way the owner of the vineyard did, paying the same generously to all the workers. How do our attitudes about people, our heart attitudes about our circumstances, our understanding of our king and his words, the way we even view and hold on to our own little ministries, how do all of those things not just proclaim grace but practice grace? Remember, the kingdom of heaven is a grace economy and our king displayed it. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you for your teaching. Our Father, forgive me for when I've been entitled about grace, for when I've boasted in a grace that I've bolstered with my own works, for where I've hidden my desire for works behind the words of grace, for where I've made grace inaccessible to others by my attitude or actions. Father, forgive us if we've been like this. Father, work in us a rejoicing in grace, a stripping back so that we are utterly dependent on all that you have done for us which we do not deserve. Father, change us so that we live publicly a grace economy so that others will come to know you who is so gracious. In Jesus' name, amen.